Amen. Let's pray real quick before you get seated. If you could put your hands out in front of you. God, we just want to invite you into not just a space, because I know that when we gather, you gather, but invite us into our hearts and minds as we experience a Good Friday together. We've heard the story, we've told the story, retold the story, but more importantly, God, we want to live the story of what took place so long ago on this day. And we are grateful for all that you have given to us. Nothing but your blood could wash away the sins of our life. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for being here, gathering together as family. You can be seated. I, I, I take it as family because uh, carving out uh, an hour to, I don't know, unless you drove from Downey, then it's probably an hour or two hours long. You know, you got that kind of thing going on. But it is, it, is, uh, it is really nice to gather together. On a quiet and a simple night, I was just talking with, well, actually with Robin, and I think I brought it up with some others, about how Easter's used to be, and they were, they were pretty busy. Come on, how many of you have been around for the five nights of uh, performances Back in the 70s and 80s, we used to do a lot of performances, right? And don't get me going on that, because we, we had, like, real thunder crashing. We had, we had a friend, poor Jeff McLaughlin. He got crucified every single year, and, and it was just, we put on these, these huge uh, plays and performances. You guys remember these? And the cantatas, and the, and the orchestras, and the, and the choirs, and oh, it, was, it was huge, and then... And it, it, behind the scenes, it was a lot of work, but it was, it, was the, it was just the era, and it was fun, and we got together, and things have changed so much. I was telling one, one friend tonight, it's like, it's changed, because like, tonight, it just feels, uh, it feels different. It does, it does feel very simplified over the last few years, really, but I am glad you're here. We're streaming, so thanks for joining us online, and I hope that you kind of walk through tonight with us and take the time as we read and get your Bibles out and read with us and uh, go right to those references, and I'm just, glad, I'm just really grateful that you're joining with us tonight. So, you know, last, uh, last Easter, it was, uh, I, I enjoyed the series. We did a series called Talk About It, and the reason I did a series called Talk About It is because... I wanted us to have a decent conversation with the rest of the world, the world, by the way, that knows somewhat of what Holy Week is about. And the world that experiences the, the week, the way of the cross, the stations of the cross. So last year we had a walkthrough and it was just amazing to go through and take time to do that. We did that again this year. Hopefully do, we'll do another year next year, but it was very different, and you know what, to be honest, going through the Stations of the Cross, I had people come up and say, you know, this is something that was not really talked about in a Pentecostal church, or maybe even a Protestant church, because there was such a rift between, like, we can't do anything that looks Catholic, because it was Catholic, and it's like, well, actually, in most things, we are brothers and sisters because it is about who Jesus is and what people believe on Jesus Christ and what he did and not the doctrines and the religion and all the things that we, that we get separated by. But we went through this. I don't know how many of you remember this, uh, but that what happened for me personally is going from the Garden of Gethsemane, or actually, yeah, from the Garden to, the, to Golgotha, to the hill. What happened to me is I did not realize after all these years that basically we're talking about 12 hours of time. And that really, that rattled me. Because I felt like, it, I felt like all of the things that happened in these, in these moments that we read about, it felt like it took day, over days. You know, it was actually just about from 3 p.m. or 3 a.m. in the morning to about 3 p.m. And it really, it got to me. 
So, it was like the most intense 12 hours that I had uh, really spent time in. Last year, I say I read, but really I listened to, I picked up a book by Tom Holland called Dominion. Now, I know the title sounds a little strange, Dominion. And the interesting thing is, I had, uh, I had read about this book, researched it before I was listening to it. Uh, Tom Holland did not believe in God. His parents had, uh, one parent had, had raised him to be an atheist, and another parent tried to raise him to kind of be religious, and uh, neither one of those really stuck. And Tom Holland found himself not a believer, but writing the book led him to make a decision about Christ. Now, I'm not saying that Tom Holland's a believer today. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I am saying is that as he began, he's a researcher, he's a deep researcher, a deep historian and all these things. And the more he got into it, the more he was forced to make decisions about who Jesus is. That's the thing that got me, right? He says a lot of things that he says, you know what, Christ being God and dying in the most gruesome and humiliating way just did not make sense to him. So you think about this. What God have you ever heard about in all of history that would allow that to happen to himself? This is what happened when he was researching this whole topic. This sounds crazy that God would allow this. So, he has studied religions and wars and leaders of ancient times. And of all the gods, of all the deities he has studied, and both kings and rulers, all the myths, all the stories about gods, all of it, right? He comes to this place where he says, none of them, none of them, ever, and it's still true today, none of them were like the God of Israel, the God of the Jews. And he said what really began to shift his thinking was the fact that the Jewish God was not self-serving, rather he served. This is Old Testament, by the way. The Jewish God was personal and protective of his people. The Jewish God could be known. And this, is, this stands out amongst all of the other gods that have ever, ever existed and studied. The Jewish God could be known. The final absurdity is when he came to Christ dying on the cross to save all of humanity. That is the point. That's the point that everybody that is saying, I don't know if I believe this or not. I don't know if this, just sound, this is just religion. This sounds just like religion. This sounds too much to believe in. All of those things. It still today comes down to Christ dying on the cross, and then Sunday we talk about him resurrecting. This is huge. It has shaped our world completely. Anyways, I'll, I'll get a little bit about Tom, and then I'm going to get off of Tom, get on to something else. In one of the articles about the book, he writes this, the notion that a God might have suffered torture and death on a cross was so shocking it appeared repulsive. Repulsive. And he says what happens is familiarity with the biblical narrative of the crucifixion has dulled our senses of just how completely novel a deity Christ was. In the ancient world, it was the role of gods who laid claim to ruling the universe to uphold its order by inflicting punishment. This is how gods work. They rule by inflicting punishment and fear. None of them suffer the consequences on themselves. I thought that was very interesting. This is exactly what Christ did. And that's really what I want to talk about it tonight. God inflicted and took the punishment upon himself. The Apostle John wrote something so interesting that I, I thought tonight this is what I would focus on. John 12, 27 through 33. I, th I might have given it to the guys upstairs. If, I don't know. I'll say it again in case they've got it. 
John 12, 27 through 33. I'm going to read from that. John writes, Now my soul is deeply troubled. If we don't... If we don't have it up, you guys can actually pull it up in your Bibles. Do you, got, do you have your Bibles? Did I catch you off guard? Or pull it up on your, your phone, your tablet. John says, my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? That's what Jesus said. John's quoting Jesus, my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? Say this hour. This hour. And this is, he continues, but this is the very reason I came. Father, in John it says, Father, bring glory to your name. Then a voice spoke from heaven saying, I've already bought, brought glory to my name and I will do so again. When the crowd heard the voice, some of them thought it was thunder, while others declared an angel had spoken to him. And Jesus told them, the voice was for your benefit, not mine. The time for judging this world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. And then he closes here in verse 33 and he says, And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. He said this to indicate how he was going to die. There's an Old Testament verse that uh, we pull from, I don't have the reference right now, but it, the verse says it, cursed is the man that hangs on a tree. And when Jesus said he'd be lifted up, it literally was that he would be lifted up onto the cross. I will draw everyone to myself. Okay, say this hour again. This hour. This is what fascinated me about this hour. And I'm going to talk about it in a way that goes... Uh, parallels with this cup, this cup of suffering that Jesus talked about. When Jesus was talking about this hour, right, what hour was he talking about? What, what, was, what hour was Jesus wanting to be saved from exactly? What cup? Because I told you the cup of suffering, right? And the hour that Jesus was talking about, what hour, what cup is he talking about? He was asking God to take away from him that he would not have to experience this hour or drink this cup. Do you remember this? It, right, it culminates in the garden. We read this. The cup of suffering came up more than once in our scripture reading. But John focuses on this hour. What was the hour? Was it the betrayal? Was, it, was, it Judah, was that the hour that Jesus was afraid to and did not want to go into and confront that hour because Judas would betray him? Was it the abandonment of everybody that came with him that night to the garden? They all fled. Robin read it. I thought that was kind of funny. Mark fled with not everything on him, but naked. They all took off. Was that the hour? Was that the thing Jesus did not want? And he asked God, if there's any other way, can I not do this? Was it the betrayal? Was it the abandonment? Maybe it was, a, maybe it was a system we now know that started around 3 a.m. in the morning that were all rigged trials. How many of you have watched any of the judicial system and you realize something is off because the trial is rigged? It's only going to go one way. There's no justice in it. There's been movies and books and all this about the injustice of a system. Was, it, was that the hour that Jesus was like, I'm, gonna, I'm going to a trial that is rigged against me? It's not fair. It's not justice. Last year, I went through, because I did not know, I did not know how many things that the religious leaders had to do that was illegal to get Jesus to that point. They had to pay off a guy to actually betray him. They had to pay off a crowd to come and yell crucify him. They had to pay off false witnesses. Do you know how many Old Testament scriptures they're violating by doing this? They held a trial before sunup. 
This is illegal in the Old Testament. They had people saying things against him. It's, the list goes on. It was a rigged trial. It was at the hour. What, maybe it was the mocking or the humiliation. Maybe it was, you know, the beatings, the floggings, the thorns driven into his skull. People were spitting on him. They were cursing him. Maybe this was the hour that Jesus said, I don't know if I can do this. Listen to the list of things that it could have been. This hour, this cup of suffering. Maybe it was the two and a half mile walk while carrying a solid wood cross beam. We've got a cross out here. If you want to practice what it may feel like, you might want to go out and drag it around. Actually, don't do that because our insurance is not going to cover it. But two and a half mile walk with a wood beam on your back after being beaten, after losing a significant amount of blood. Was that the hour? Was it the, mo was it the moment that the nails pierced into his ankles and both wrists? Was it the moment they hoisted his body up on a cross and most likely dropped it into a hole, causing immense pain to shoot through his entire body? Was this the moment? Was this the hour that Jesus said, if you could take this away, if there's any other way, I would, I would entertain that? This hour. This cup of suffering. What, what was it? Maybe he was looking down on the crowd and seeing a mix of mockers and as well as friends, seeing his own mother's heart breaking before him. Where a son is going to die before the parent. That's a heartbreak. It was none of this. It was none of this. This is not the hours that he is talking about that he would want to avoid in John. And this is not the cup that Jesus talked about in the Garden of Gethsemane that he cried out to Father God if there were any other way that I would not have to drink of this cup of suffering. So what is it? Well, Jesus was asking a way around because the thing that he was going to have to endure was the worst thing that had ever happened in his entire existence. And that's what he was, this is what he's going to be, he's going to be doing. In that last hour, he wondered if he could do the job, if he could fulfill the mission set before him. What was that mission? What was that last hour all about? Jesus knew that in that last hour, he would become sin. He wouldn't just become sin for himself because he was sinless. He was innocent. He had not done anything ever in his life. It wasn't his sin. It wasn't the sin of Pilate or the sin of anyone in the crowd or the soldiers that beat him. It was all of their sin. It was all of humanity that came before him. And it was all humanity that goes forward to tonight. That hour meant that he would take sin on of, of all of the human race for all time for everyone, including you. That is part of of what he was wondering, can I do that? But it wasn't even the taking on of sin. Because what happened is that when he took upon himself all of the sin of all humanity, that God could not look at him. And not only could God not look at him, God's presence would be withdrawn from him for a moment 
that was indescribable for him to experience. He knew when he took on all of our sin, he knew that God's presence would be withdrawn and he would be completely alone. If you want to think about this, in that moment, Jesus would be experiencing the hell that everybody chides and teases and makes fun of when all your friends and all our friends said, oh, I can't wait to party in hell. This is the moment Jesus would experience hell because there is no presence of God. This is without God. Could he survive dying without God's presence and fully, willingly, and completely be the sacrifice for all humanity to not one time call on the powers of all the angels to say, I, I, I can't do it. Let me out of this. Come and rescue me. He would be totally and deeply disconnected from God. You know, we look at our series of highs and lows, our successes in our own life, right? We look at these, we look, at, we look through a lens, lens of pain, sorrows. We have all kinds of them. Sometimes they run at the same time. We have hospitals or we have funeral homes as well as we have joy-filled celebrations like weddings and birthday parties. I can name one right now. Our sister Shirley Brown went into the hospital for a a multi-bypass operation and they had to open her up and do heart surgery on her. And when she went in, her and Tom were supposed to celebrate their 59th wedding anniversary. So you can imagine for a moment the pain and the celebration are together. This is our life. This is humanity. We have these moments. Jesus experienced all of the human moments of highs and lows and parties and, and, and times where people were suffering and they were sick. But he was anchored in something that was much, much deeper, more eternal. He was anchored in God's presence all the time time while he was here and really for all past and now all future he the presence of God was forever with him the presence of God was in him in his mom's tummy he had only known the presence of God when he was born he could feel the love of the father as an infant as a toddler as a preschooler as a young boy, as a teenager, as a young man, he has only known that loving gaze of a father towards the son that is so huge. That's all he'd known. He'd only known the sweet and tender voice of his father speaking to him all the time. When he went to the mountains to pray, when he'd come down and he was exhausted, he would hear his father's voice. It was always there. And yet, for this moment, that wouldn't happen. This hour, it would not be there. It would be withdrawn. So, the Bible talks about how God sees us when we sit and when we rise. David writes about this, this closeness that, that God has with us in Psalm 139. Oh, Lord, you've searched me and known me. You know when I sit down. You know when I rise up. You understand my thoughts from afar. You, you scrutinize my path and my lying down. You're intimately acquainted with all of my ways. This is how God feels about you, about us. He knows all of our weaknesses and struggles. He knows those things. Even before there was a word that comes out of your mouth, he knows what it's going to be. David says that in that verse, you know, he, God winnows and sifts through our thoughts, constantly sifting through what we are thinking about. 
He's the only one that could do this. God sifts through our thoughts. And when he responds to us, it is out of love towards you. But we don't, we don't, we don't feel that from God all the time. It's not, it's not God's fault, it's ours. We don't feel that sense of presence like Jesus did because we're not communing, we're not, we're not sitting, we're not listening, we're not actively engaged. We just, we're not like that. We, we get distracted, we get busy, we get, we get all bent out of shape, we get a lot of things. We're just not, we're not like that all the time. But God's thoughts towards us, they're always there. They're always there. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, God's mercies, his favor. Every single day that you wake up is brand new. Brand new every morning. His steadfastness, his faithfulness is towards us. This is what Jeremiah told us in Lamentations. This is how God feels about us. But these are all thoughts that God has towards us. And we have sin, we have struggles, we've got dark fog of our own humanity, we've got issues in our life. And so we don't have these same thoughts when it comes to thinking about God all the time. Jesus had it. He had it all the time. He learned to not only listen to God's voice and feel God's good pleasure towards him, he, he also could keep his thoughts and his feelings focused on God. There was that dynamic that went on. Jesus did all of this in such intimacy of relationship, but he also did this in obedience to God in his mission, to finish the mission. So, I want, if you could, I want us to go, I'm wondering if you guys could pull this up. I don't know if I, I thought I'd give you guys these scriptures, but I might not have done it. I would like for you to put up for a moment, put up Psalm 139, If you guys can find that, because I want to do something tonight for just a few moments. For we're going to close really quick here. If you have your Bible, you can turn to this Psalm one thirty nine. I don't think we're going to be able to get it up. That's my fault, though. Don't don't blame the tech guys. Why don't you close your eyes for a moment? Unless you're reading it, then that, go ahead, keep reading it. But if you don't have your Bible, I'm reading out of Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path. Am I lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways? Even before there's a word on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before, and you've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, it is too high. I cannot attain it. I cannot attain it. I would, I would say this. When, I, when you got home today, tomorrow, before Sunday, before Easter, I would open up out of Psalm 139 and I would read that psalm. And I would ask you this. I would ask you to pause and reflect on that psalm of how God feels about you. And when you're reflecting on those things, I would like you to think about what words stand out, what phrases stand out about how God sees you. And just stay in there for a little bit. And when you are, when you are done, after a few minutes, then I would ask that you would have a time of prayer, just reflecting back to God what you feel, what you think about towards Him. That you would use your words, not just sit quietly, 
but use your words and say to God how you think about him, what you feel about him after reading that psalm. Well, on the cross, that final hour came, the cup would be drank completely. The moment when Jesus would briefly lose that intimacy with God that I talked about. And that overwhelming flood of blood that he only knew his entire life, it would, it would be gone. And then, without the presence of God, this is the part that gets me, without the presence of God, he would have to finish the mission on his own. This is hard for me to even fathom. He would be completely and utterly alone. In Mark 15, 33 and 34, Mark tells us at noon darkness fell across the whole land until 3 o'clock. Then at 3 o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. He cries out at this point at 3 o'clock, and now you know why he cries out. Because the presence of God was not with him, because God could not look upon sin, and God could not have his presence in Jesus at this moment. And when that took place, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? 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 It's powerful. Why have you forsaken me? All the pain, the suffering, humiliation, and even death itself would be done for you and I. Normally, this is what we focus on. I get it. Because I don't, I don't know who could endure all that Jesus went through. But I want you to understand more than that. Jesus' mission meant that he was separated from God so that we will never have to be separated from God. That's the hour. That's the cup. That's the suffering that he drank for us so that we would not drink that bitter cup of separation from God. That passage in John where Jesus prayed, Father, save me from this hour. I am glad that God did not answer that prayer and that Jesus went the full distance of completing what he completed on the cross for us. Let's pray. Father, I am so thankful for you. I am so thankful that even in my sin and even in my disobedience and even in my stubbornness, and even in my anger and my frustration and my jealousies and my comparisons and my humanity, I am thankful thankful that your love is completely towards me still. May I not just only remember this on a yearly moment in time, but may I carry this with me throughout my life. And recognize that this intimate relationship that you have with me 
can be reciprocated just by me reaching out to you and to talk to you, to confess to you, to bring the needs and issues in my life to you. I am thankful, God, for the work, Jesus, that he did. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.